Well, if you would, open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 9. Now, before I get to the sermon today, though, um, I think it would be good to take a moment to recognize that uh, no matter which side you were rooting for, something unprecedented happened yesterday. The Terps beat Penn State at football. Um, unprecedented art. <clears throat> um, no, no, no matter how you feel about the outcome of this election, I think we'd all agree it's been an intense few months. Uh, we've gone through what I, I think in my lifetime we could safely say is the most contentious national election. Uh, we've been doing so in the midst of a, a global pandemic with all kinds of, of personal and national effects. So I have a sense, call me crazy, that, that anxiety has been a bit on the rise. Uh, that distraction and maybe a feeling of troubledness uh, has been on the rise. I know it, it has in my own heart at times this week. So today, as we open God's word in the midst of it all, I think the Lord is calling us through Daniel chapter 9, this next step in the journey through Daniel, to remember who he is and pray. That's what Daniel does here in this chapter. It's unique in many ways from the rest of what we've seen in this book, what we will see in the weeks to come. Uh, we've seen Daniel interact with kings. We've seen Daniel interact with, with uh, corrupt bureaucrats. We've seen him interact with sworn enemies. In many ways, Daniel's been a very public book. But here, we will get a glimpse of Daniel interacting just with God. So read with me in, in Daniel chapter 9. I'll read through verse 19. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, by descent a Mede, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy, with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled turning aside from your commandments and rules. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us opens shame. As at this day, to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel, those who are near and those who are far away in all the lands to which you have driven them because of the treachery that they have committed against you. To us, O Lord, belongs open shame to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness for we have rebelled against him and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in his laws which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice. And the curse and oath that are written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us because we have sinned against him. He has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our rulers who ruled us by bringing upon us a great calamity. For under the whole heaven there has not been done anything like what has been done against Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us, yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God, turning from our iniquities and gaining insight by your truth. 
Therefore, the Lord has kept ready the calamity and has brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works that he has done, and we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself as at this day, we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all your righteous acts, Let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy hill, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a byword among all who are around us. Now, therefore, O our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his pleas for mercy. And for your own sake, O Lord, make your face to shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. O my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. O Lord, hear. O O Lord, forgive. O Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, O my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. Why do you pray? Why do you pray? Prayer, I think, has somewhat of an interesting reputation these days. Uh, If someone responds to a tragedy online with a sentiment, something along the lines of, uh, we're thinking of you and praying for you, you can usually just count down the seconds before the thoughts and prayers memes show up, uh, mocking a kind of uh, insincerity that's assumed in uh, the behalf of the person who said it. Now, for sure, sentiments like that are meaningless if they are insincere cop-outs for personal responsibility. But if you believe, as Christians do, that God really does reign over all things, and that he really does act in human events and work all things together for the, the good of his people and for his own glory, then the most rational, reasonable, reasonable, even strategic and impactful thing that you could do is appeal to that God in prayer. Prayer, though, is more than just a smart move pragmatically. It's the natural response of people who know and love the one they're praying to. If you go through something significant in your life and you don't tell your spouse or you don't tell your closest family and friends. Well, that usually reveals something about the nature and the state of that relationship. So just like communication in in marriage, prayer is the way we cultivate our relationship with God. And it's one of the ways that, that it's revealed what the nature of our relationship with God is like. So when the people of God love and follow him, find themselves in these kinds of dire straits, as Daniel has here, the most natural thing in the world for them to do is to pray. Let's think for a moment about the the setting that Daniel's in. Uh, Daniel wakes up in Babylon one morning in the aftermath of an election. Okay, maybe it wasn't exactly an election, but bear with me here. Uh, As tumultuous as our own election season may have seemed, what Daniel has just gone through is way worse. Uh, The Babylonian administration that we've heard about in these weeks that Daniel has served his entire adult life has been overthrown. And he wakes up at some point in, in the first year of the reign of a new administration. And when he wakes up one morning, he decides to read his Bible. Maybe he's got anxieties about the new regime. We don't know. 
In his case, rightfully so. Because in the next four years, as we've uh, heard in prior weeks, this same administration will conspire to have him thrown in a den of lions. So his anxieties would be well justified. Whatever the reason, Daniel turns to God's word. And in his quiet time that morning, Daniel reads the book of Jeremiah. And he apparently has a dramatic realization. I don't know if if all of Daniel's morning devotions were this spectacular. Maybe most of them were him just reading the scrolls. But on this day, some massive light bulbs go off as he's reading the book of Jeremiah. Now, maybe you've done an annual Bible reading plan and you have read the book of Jeremiah and you're thinking, really? The the lights went off in that book? Uh, If you're familiar with it, it has a lot about the sorrow of the prophet Jeremiah over the state of the people of Israel. It's long. Jeremiah is known as the prophet of tears. But here's why this is such a powerful morning devotion for Daniel. Verse 2 here in chapter 9 says, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. So as Daniel is, is reading The prophet Jeremiah, he realizes, apparently for the first time, he he perceives that God has set a time limit on Israel's exile. And that that time in Babylon is almost up. Now, Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah, might feel like ancient history to you. But it could not have been more practical in this moment for Daniel. He probably read a passage like Jeremiah 29, which says, For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promises and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Powerful morning devotions for Daniel. I have been uh, told repeatedly through this election cycle Uh, various sentiments all along the lines of of wake up. Um, Progressives have encouraged me to get woke to the systemic societal problems that they believe conservatives are oblivious to. Conservatives have told me to wake up to the ideologies they believe are overtaking the country that progressives are oblivious to. And when they say things like this, they want us to perceive something to become alert to something that they don't think we currently see. Well, in this moment, Daniel wakes up. And the reality he begins to perceive is actually the most crucial reality for men and women to get their hearts around and wake up to. And it's the reality that God is intervening in human history for the good of his people. And Daniel begins to perceive, he begins to become aware of the fact that Israel's time in exile has had a divine purpose. And if the people would turn to him in repentance and faith, he would restore them. Now, how would you respond if you had had Daniel's quiet time that morning? 
uh, relief that these years of exile were finally over. Uh, Daniel apparently had significant ability as a government uh, administrator. Maybe you'd start planning the return to Judah. Well, look at what Daniel does in verse 3. It says, Then I turned my face to the Lord God. Another translation says, I gave the Lord my attention. I think we, as, as Christians, we seek to live our lives knowing that we live before God. But we're usually doing something else too, right? Uh, there is something, though, about stopping everything else. And as Daniel says, giving the Lord your attention. Uh, when you stop talking to God in passing and instead turn your face to him, uh, when my kids were little and we wanted to make sure we got the message across, before we started talking, we said, look at my eyes. Any other parents pull that trick? Look at my face. <laughs> it means I got something important I'm about to tell you and I want to make sure it gets through. Daniel turns his face to the Lord. There are times when we pray as we're doing other things. That's great. It's good to pray on the commute. Uh, it's good to pray while you're doing the chores. But there's a time to look to the Lord and give him your undivided attention. When was the last time you turned your face to the Lord? Verse 3 goes on. He says, I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. This is a unique approach to prayer, even for Daniel. There are times for routine prayer. There are times for morning prayer and mealtime prayer and bedtime prayer. Those are great. And we've seen Daniel pray those kinds of routine, regular prayers already in this book. There are times for, for brief prayers under your breath in a moment of need. But there are also times... When you don't just work prayer into your life, but you reorient your life around prayer. And that's what Daniel's doing here. I think it's easy for us to, to just sprint past descriptions like the one we have in verse 2. But let's just think practically for a moment about what this would have meant for Daniel. We know from other portions of Daniel that at this point, he is essentially the equivalent of the governor of a third of Babylon. The man has stuff to do. Uh, his task list would have been a mile long. A number of people probably looking to him for, for leadership and direction. And despite all that, he stops and he totally adjusts all his routines. He doesn't eat. He's not present at the staff lunches or the state, the state dinners. Uh, he, he changes his clothes. He isn't wearing the Babylonian equivalent of a suit and tie. He, he, he didn't switch them out for some, some telework sweatpants either. Uh, Daniel's got on some uncomfortable clothes that perpetually remind him that he is in a season of seeking the face of God. In this moment, he totally reorients his routine to enter into a time of intentional, focused, and even self-denying prayer. I think it's worth just making the observation here that if Daniel needed both regular, routine times of prayer in his daily life, as well as times of focused, intentional turning of his face to the Lord. If he needed both, so do we. There will be times in life when the most important, the most strategic thing you could do is stop everything else and totally reorient your life around prayer. 
And friends, there's no prescription for that. We don't have a manual for when and how often and how long. But I want to encourage you to consider finding a time in your year where instead of fitting life, uh, instead of fitting prayer into life, you fit your life around prayer. Some of you may be in a season right now for all kinds of different reasons. When the best thing you could do for your soul and for your situation is to turn your face to God. Let me just take a few minutes to, to take a closer look at the prayer itself. Uh, at some point early on in my own discipleship, I was taught to pray according to an acronym, ACTS. Uh, it stands for adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. Supplication is just petition or requests. Uh, adoration is where we say, God, hallowed be your name. It's where we recognize and praise God for who he is. Confession is when we, uh, we pray, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who've sinned against us. So we acknowledge before God the ways we've fallen short of his glory. Thanksgiving is, is a time to, to, in all things, give thanks, as we're called to. And specifically, this side of the cross, it's a time to thank God for his work in us through the gospel for the forgiveness of our sins that we, we have, that we've just confessed because of what Christ has done. And then supplication is a time to, to petition God for our own needs, for the needs of others in our lives, for the community and, and for the world. Well, in many ways, Daniel's prayer here follows that outline. Maybe with the exception of thanksgiving, maybe because of his situation, he didn't feel like... Uh, he had much on that front in this moment. But there's adoration in verse 4. There's confession in verses 5 through 15. And supplication or petition in verses 16 through 19. And let me just sum it up. Uh, just one simple sentence that I think communicates what Daniel's prayer shows us. It's that because of God's steadfast love, we confess our sin and we plead for help for God's glory. It's a simple sentence that I think summarizes the call of Daniel's prayer. Because of God's steadfast love, we confess our sin, we plead for help for God's glory. Let me just briefly consider that statement in light of Daniel's prayer. Daniel starts his prayer by calling on God by his covenant name, Yahweh. It's translated in our English Bibles as Lord, usually printed in all caps. There's only one place in the entire book of Daniel where that particular name for God is used, and it's only in chapter 9. And it's used here seven times. Daniel is praying in light of the covenant that God had made with Israel. He's calling on God as Israel's covenant Lord. He's functioning here as a kind of covenant intercessor. He's appealing to God on the basis of his covenant word. In Deuteronomy 28, God lays out the, the stipulations of the blessings and the, the curses of the covenant. The blessings of obedience are vast. And the consequences of disobedience are, are severe. And Daniel acknowledges the fact that God has been faithful to his word, but the people have not been faithful to theirs. So in verse 13, he prays, As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity... The exile of the people, the destruction of Jerusalem, all this calamity has come upon us, yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God. We have not turned from our iniquities and gained insight by your truth. Therefore, the Lord has kept ready the calamity and has brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works that he has done. And we have not obeyed his voice. 
If you go on reading in the book of Deuteronomy, God anticipates Israel's disobedience. But because our covenant God is a God who's slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, even though he has made a covenant with a people by his grace, knowing that there would come a day when they would fail to upkeep it, he then presents a way when that would happen for his people to find mercy. He says, and when all these things come upon you, Deuteronomy 30, the blessing and the curse of the covenant, which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, and return to the Lord your God, you and your children, and obey his voice in all that I command you today with all your heart and with all your soul, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have mercy upon you. And he will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. I think the reason that Daniel is so deeply grieved in this prayer by his own sin and by the sin of Israel was that he realized in this moment that God's word had been so sure and his promises of mercy so clear and that all he required of his people was that they call on him for mercy, but they had not done it. All these years in exile, the people had yet to come before him and plead for the very mercy that would result in their deliverance that God had already promised them they could have. I think there are many Christians walking around carrying a persistent sense of guilt because they question the nature of God's heart. They doubt the truthfulness of his promises. And they neglect his invitation to turn to him for mercy. The path to freedom for Israel and for you starts with recognizing that our God is a covenant-keeping God of steadfast love. And his mercy can be yours today. He is not withholding it. He isn't uh, waiting for you to do enough to be able to earn it. According to Deuteronomy 30, all he wants you to do is ask for it. And that's what Daniel does here in Daniel 9. Because when, when God disciplines his children, when they go through seasons of difficulty, just as the people of Israel did through the exile... That discipline is never punitive. It's redemptive. God says this to the church in Hebrews 12. He says, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines who? The one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you. As sons. So God's aim in the exile is not to destroy Israel, it's to restore Israel. And his aim in the times of discipline in our own lives is not to destroy us, not to harm us, but to train us and to strengthen us and to restore us. Because what God's covenant reveals is that he is more committed to his people than his people are to him. God's love is steadfast and steady and sure, even when ours is fickle and cold. And so Psalm 30 says, pain lasts for the night, but joy comes in the morning. So in this prayer, Daniel is doing the very thing God has called his people to do when they find himself, themselves in these situations. Because his kindness leads them to repentance. There are two things fundamentally that Daniel confesses. One, that he had failed to listen to God's word. And two, that he had failed to obey God's word. And through this confession, he seeks God's restoration. 
He prays this not only for himself, although he certainly includes himself, but he also prays this on behalf of the people. These are the people who'd entered into this covenant with God. And he, as a leader among them, had apparently been guilty of the same sins they had been guilty of. And so he can, as a, as a representative, come before God and ask for his forgiveness. As we think about how confession functions in the life of a Christian, because it does and it ought to, uh, I think it's, it's easy for us to increasingly see it as maybe a, an overly introspective, um, defeatist kind of mentality that, that Christians ought not pursue. But in fact, confession and acknowledgement of sin before God is the ordained means God has given us to receive and find the restoration of his mercy. I think Kevin DeYoung puts this so well, I couldn't improve on it. I want to just read you what he says. He says, some of us become Christians and just go on our merry way, never thinking of sin, while others fixate on our failings and suffer from despair. One person feels no conviction of sin. The other person feels no relief from sin. Neither of these habits should mark the Christian. The Christian should often feel conviction, confess, and be cleansed. The cleansing, mind you, is not like the expunging of a guilty record before the judge. That's already been accomplished. This cleansing is more like the scraping of barnacles off the hull of a ship so it can move freely again. We need confession of sin before God like a child needs to own up to her mistakes before mom and dad. Not to earn God's love, but to rest in it and know it more fully. I want to encourage you, friend, if you've walked in here bearing a, either a low-grade sense of guilt or when I use the word guilt, you know exactly what I mean because it settles on you acutely this morning. The pathway to freedom is repentance and faith. Uh, rather than stuff it and hide it and avoid it, acknowledging it clearly and honestly before a merciful God of steadfast love, receiving the fullness of his forgiveness and grace and letting him restore you by the power of the Holy Spirit is God's invitation to you today. But I love Daniel doesn't stop there. He closes his prayer pleading for the sake of the glory of God. Let me read it to you in verse 17. He says, Now, therefore, O our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his pleas for mercy. And for your own sake, O Lord, make your face to shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. O oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eye and see our desolations and the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake. Twice. For your own sake, O oh my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. The greatest tragedy in the exile of the people of God and the destruction of Jerusalem wasn't ultimately the effect it had on the land or the effect it had on the people. It was the effect it had on earth, on the reputation of God. And likewise, the greatest tragedy that occurs when the people of God fail to live according to the ways of God is that it tarnishes God's good name on the earth. So when we come to him in confession and when we, when we plead with him to restore us, we do so ultimately in order to see the glory of God's name restored. And by the grace of God, it is. 
There is nothing that more greatly champions the mercy and the glory of God and the life of the church through Jesus Christ than we, when we acknowledge the reality of the fact that we have not kept his ways. And yet he loved us and set us free from our sins by his blood. It puts the mercy and the greatness of the love of God on full display when we acknowledge it in confession for his glory. Psalm 115 says it like this, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Why should the nations say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens and he does all that he pleases. As we uh, prepare to close in singing and the worship team is gonna, gonna come back, I want us to just take a moment now before we begin to sing, right where you are before we rush off into the rest of our day, just for a minute now, for you and your own heart, to set your face before the Lord, to turn your attention before the Lord. And as you do, to examine yourself before God, to come before him in a spirit of repentance and faith, and to plead to him for his mercy and grace in your life, knowing that when you do, you approach a throne of grace. You approach a God who is eager, Hebrews says, to give us grace that we might receive mercy and help in time of need. Let's take a moment now in quiet prayer, and then the team will lead us as we sing.